1815, a French sailor named Edmond Dantes, his best friend, Fernand Mondego, go ashore on the Isle of Elba, home to exiled Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. When Edmund promises to deliver a harmless letter from Napoleon to a friend, he is arrested for treason when he returns home. Fernand's betrayal lands Edmund in prison for 13 years, where he plots his elaborate vengeance against those who ruined his life. Upon escape to aid in his revenge, he reinvents himself as the mysterious, intriguing, and lavishly wealthy nobleman, the Count of Monte Cristo. I'm Connor Isgari. And I'm Colton Jenkins. And this is Filmgasm. <laughs> Happy Wednesday and welcome to the Filmgasm podcast. Today's episode is my pick of our cycle, one of my lifelong favorite adventure films, The Count of Monte Cristo. This is just one of those films I found as a kid and instantly adored. It's got everything, sword fights, history, true love, betrayal, buried treasure, prison breaks, revenge, and so much more. Uh, I don't. I honestly can't explain what drew me to this. I just, I watched it when I was like 10 and thought this is awesome and I never... I never look back. <laughs> it also has Dumbledore in it. Yeah, it's Dumbledore. It's like his second to last movie. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah I feel exactly the same way. Like when um, when you said that we were doing this movie, I was kind of like, oh, like kind of Monte Cristo. Like that book is that book is it's a slow burn. But then I was watching this movie and I got really invested. Yeah. It really does have everything. It's funny at times. You know, it's intense at times. And the sword fights are really fun to watch. Yeah, it's like uh, Kevin Reynolds read the book and thought this could use some trimming. Let's trim this fat. Let's make this streamlined. And we got a movie. And I, I respect that. Because sometimes, you know, when they chop a book to bits to make a movie, I'm mostly like, ah, shit, I don't want this. But it worked this time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Before we get into it, I do have two updates on past episodes on the Rewind. <laughs> My first update takes us back to episode 163 on Ghostbusters. Sony has announced a currently untitled Ghostbusters animated movie from Afterlife writers Jason Reitman and Gil Keenan. In addition, Sony has confirmed that the sequel to Ghostbusters Afterlife will take place in New York City. So Ghostbusters is coming home. Uh, Mm -hmm. But an animated movie. Very interesting. I mean, Ghostbusters has had pretty good success in animation in the past uh, with their, you know, the real Ghostbusters show in the 90s. So uh, I'm on. I'm I'm in. I love Ghostbusters. Oh yeah, I, I so I haven't seen the new movie, and it is I've I haven't seen it only because I'm so like jaded with the with, like the remake that came out in when it came out like 2017. Yeah, and, around then. Like, I, I'm not in the group of people that say that they ruined Ghostbusters because I don't think you can ruin a franchise that already is like really good. I think that that movie. I think it was a fine movie, but I don't think it was a good Ghostbusters movie. No. So just because of that, I'm kind of skeptical of watching the new movie. But I hear it's I hear it's really good, and they kind of found sort of like their roots again. So take it from a lifelong Ghostbusters fan who hated the 2016 movie. Afterlife is really good. It's okay. It's the second best Ghostbusters movie. Uh. It's got everything. It's got a great new cast that is really, really uh, knows what they're doing, does a really good job connecting it to the classics, like to the first two films. And Jason Reitman, the guy who did it, is Ivan Reitman's son, the guy who did the first two movies. So it's very important in terms of passing the torch. Um, I loved it. So I'm excited for the future of Ghostbusters. You said second, second best. So is it Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and then Ghostbusters 2? Yes. Okay. Yep. And I love Ghostbusters too. So that was okay. that was a lot to, to 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 take in. I was like, this is really good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll I'll definitely watch it then. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited. Yeah, I'm wondering what this Ghostbusters animated movie is going to be. And we're going back to New York for Afterlife. To, for, I guess Ghostbusters Four. Yeah. Uh, bring it on. I wonder what's changed. I'm excited. They can do so much with animated with an, with animation, especially with Ghostbusters. Like that's going to be good. I'm, I'm excited yeah, for sure. Do they know yeah. who the cast is? Not yet. This was just announced like two days ago. So oh. it's very early development. But uh, I'm sure we'll get a really cool cast. I mean, everybody loves Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. Except for the guy who made the 2016 one when he came out and said, I don't like Ghostbusters, but I'm going to make this movie. <laughs> oh, my God. Everyone was like, 
Why? <laughs> <laughs> and my next update takes us back to episode 167 on Spider-Man. An extended cut of Spider-Man No Way Home is being re-released in theaters over Labor Day weekend. Tickets go on sale August 9th. So we're getting an extended No Way Home in the movies Ooh. again. I am probably going to see that. Oh, yeah. Um, Spider-Man is my all-time favorite superhero. I'm a huge fanboy. It's kind of a problem, honestly, because I see no <laughs> I'm, I see no wrong with Spider-Man movies. Um, but uh, No Way Home, I think, was my... So for a while, Into the Spider-Verse was my favorite Spider-Man movie. Mm-hmm. They weren't necessarily my favorite, like Spider-Man, but my favorite Spider movie. And then No Way Home came out, and that took the cake because that was perfection. Like, seriously. it's I I am very worried about every Spider-Man movie going forward because that oh, yeah. insane mountain to climb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was yep. amazing. I one of the best theater experiences of my life. Yes, and I'm pro- I, I I I I think about that like at least once a week. Like we actually got that movie. Like it actually happened. <laughs> like that's that is a really big deal. Like these studios like came together and like, all right, we will give the fans what they want. If one person of that cast said no, it all falls apart. Yes. Like we needed everybody and everyone was on board. And that's that's magical. That doesn't happen in Hollywood very often. That's a once in a time kind of movie. It really is. And I like to think they didn't have a backup plan. They were like, hey, if they say no, we're not making this fucking movie. I, I thought about that. I did find out what the backup the backup plan was, and it wasn't great. What was it? Craven the Hunter. That's yeah. it. It was just Tom Holland's on the run. Craven shows up in New York to hunt him down, and uh, and 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 that that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's a great like Spider Man two, but not a yeah, not an epic finale. Yeah, and that's what I I liked about this movie as a finale because it seems like these the like the the three MCU Spider-Man movies, they seem like an origin story. Like he became Spider-Man at the end of No Way Home, which I thought was pretty kick-ass. Yeah. He lost his Avengers buddies. He lost his support system. Like this is... No, he lost uh, literally everything. Yeah. And he's got his, you know, hand-stitched costume. Doesn't have all that Stark tech. He's just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man now. Uh, I'm so... I'm, I'm honestly very excited for the next Spider-Man movie. Like really, really excited because... I feel like, and I don't know why I got this feeling, but at the end of No Way Home, when he's swinging through New York in his new suit, I got the feeling of like that, uh, like the '90s Spider-Man cartoon, you know, yeah. the one with that rock intro. The did yeah. yeah, I got that feeling. I love, and that I'm show. excited. Yeah, <laughs> I always thought it was funny how like everyone had lasers instead of guns because it was a kid <laughs> show, and you weren't allowed to say kill. Everyone got destroyed. Yep, <laughs> and then it just ended with like no closure yeah <laughs> my favorite episode of that show is he meets like a was it like madam madam spider i don't know it's some oh madam web madam yeah. web yeah oh man that episode was crazy <laughs> i i thought the, the whole venom and carnage thing was done really well on that oh, yeah. show that was cool i had the daredevil episodes on a set like a dvd it's like spider-man meets daredevil and it was like a three-part story where he helps him take down the kingpin oh, that's like, cool oh. That was a cool show. Uh, all right. So, it's new, uh, well, old Spider Man with new scenes coming out Labor Day, August 9th. Get your tickets. Hell yeah. So, The Count of Monte Cristo began life as a novel by Alexandre Dumas in 1844. Uh, Dumas also wrote The Man in the Iron Mask and The Three Musketeers. So, he was a uh, pretty successful, kind of the Stephen King of his time, if you will. Yeah. Interconnected <laughs> universe and all that. <laughs> Oh, are they all connected? The fucking musketeers show up in the Man in the Iron Mask. Oh shit, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, he was doing he was doing it first. <laughs> <laughs> the original, uh, yeah, the OG. <laughs> the film changed a number of details from the book, uh, mainly the relationship between Dantes and Mondego. In the book, Mondego is a jealous rival, doesn't really know Edmund, but it's like I want what he has. Let's take this guy down. Which mm-hmm. is pretty fucked up. But it's more fucked up in the movie because he's his best friend who betrays him. And I thought that was way better, way more believable hatred. Yeah. And I kind of I really like the fact that the one that was jealous is the rich noble, because like I've never seen that ever in anything. Well, he's the man who has everything, but nothing. Yeah. I love that. And Dante is the man who has nothing, but he has everything. 
And I like the line he says. He's like, I'm not supposed to want to be you. Yeah. Well, I love the Mercedes uh, story about the whistle and the pony. It's like, yeah. Mondego was jealous because Edmund knows how to be happy. He knows how to, you know, appreciate what he's got. And Mondego has been given everything his whole life. So he doesn't appreciate a goddamn thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's very well done. Um, Um, But if I got a whistle and my brother got a pony, I'd be pissed. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, if I got a whistle and my like rich friend down the road got a pony, I'd be like, that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Happy birthday. Uh, but yeah, I think I don't usually like when, you know, things are changed from a book, but in this case, I was like, you know what, that was probably a smart way to go. Cause the book is dense has a lot of subplots that really don't work in a, mm-hmm. in a movie like this would have made the thing four and a half hours long. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I thought the same thing. Like I said, I thought this movie was going to be boring, but it, um, it spends the right amount of time on everything. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. The pacing is perfect. It, it really is like um, I'm glad that they didn't skimp on the prison scene. Like I wasn't like a, some stupid like montage time skip. They it was it was really well done. Like, you know, like Edmund went to Hogwarts with Dumbledore and he taught him, you know, how to be a sword fighter. So that was great. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the prison's the best part. Like that's where we he becomes the Count of Monte Cristo. That's where Edmund Dantes dies. And oh, yeah. It's great. It's so believable. I don't know what they did with uh, Jim Caviezel's makeup or something, but I, I believed he aged 13 years. Like, yeah. It, you felt that in him. I don't know how they did that, but yeah, well done. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. And I'm surprised that they like, they let it be 13 years. Like that's a hefty time to be away. Yeah. That's a long time to seethe to, you know, for things in, in life to change for there to be a teenage son that you got to deal with. Yeah. And he 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 only wanted revenge for 13 years straight. That's all he wanted. That's <laughs> I mean, I don't blame him. It kept him alive. Like he he didn't have hope. He had vengeance. You know. <laughs> and I love everyone in his life is like trust in God and he's like fuck God like every time. He's like no, I have vengeance. <laughs> yep. Maybe and I'm happen. glad he didn't I'm glad he didn't like change that at the end. Like he never, I mean, he kind of did. Cause he's like, okay, I'll, I'll now use the things I use for revenge for good. But he yeah. never was like, he was like, Oh my God, you're right. It's God. Yeah. No, he's like, no, fuck that. This is me. I'm killing these people because fuck them. Well, in the end, he does give Fernand that out. He's like, you know, when he, when he finds out he has a son, he's like, just go. I'll forget the whole thing. Just don't come back. Yeah. And then Monday goes like, no, like you don't get to have everything when I have nothing. Like shit. Yeah. The hatred here, like, how were they ever <laughs> friends? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Like, even at the beginning, I was like, I was like, all right, like, they obviously don't like each other. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I would love to see, like, before all this, all this happened, like, clearly, Mondego was stewing for years about this. And I, I'm sure, you know, it was mostly about Mercedes. He's like, I want that. <laughs> and, yeah. but I, I want to know, like, how'd they meet? Did they grow up together? Like, what was the, what was the moment where Mondego's like, fuck this guy. I, like, I don't want him anymore. I don't know why, because their relationship is nothing like it. But I got the, I got, I was for a split second at the beginning. Um, I think when they're in, they're on the island and um, they're like in that house and, it was after he came back with the letter. I got like a subtle vibe of um, uh, what are their names? The people in Road to El Dorado. So maybe that's the backstory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I, I yeah, I love Road to El Dorado. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the 2002 version of this film is the 17th film adaptation of the book. Jesus. Uh, we don't have time to dig into. 17 different versions of the same story and this is honestly the only one i've ever seen so i yeah go if you want to go see you know the 1929 four hour count monte cristo that's on you oh my god is it really four hours oh yeah there was a time when nobody gave a shit how long movies were they were just like as long as it takes oh my god yeah david lynch um but i would like to check out some of those i'd like to see a different version of this Weirdly enough, the only other time I've seen the Count of Monte Cristo in fiction was in Once Upon a Time. <laughs> huh. 
Yeah, eventually they ran out of fairy tales and started going into literature. <laughs> and the Count of Monte Cristo showed up at one point. Oh my God. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> no Disney kid's going to know who this is. <laughs> that's fucking, that's beautiful. I could see maybe the Three Musketeers in Once Upon a Time, but I don't know about this. This is, what the fuck? Yeah, that show went off the rails really fast. <laughs> yeah, it did. So the film, this version, was directed by Kevin Reynolds, who also directed Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Waterworld, Risen, Tristan and Isolde, and past filmgasm subject, The Beast. Uh, decent track record. I, I want I want to like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves so much, yeah. but I can't get past fucking Costner. I don't like Kevin Costner. I was just about to say I love Waterworld because I feel like um, like that role fits Kevin Costner so well. And I've never seen another movie like Waterworld. But yeah, Robin Hood. And, uh, yeah. It's just, you've got so many talented English actors, many of whom are in that movie. Mm-hmm. But you, you give Robin Hood to Kevin Costner, who spends the yeah. first like half hour trying to do a British accent and then just fucking gives yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Eh. Eh. And then you got Christian Slater wandering around. Like, what is with that movie? <laughs> uh, but I do, you know, I like aspects of it. Uh, the Beast was really cool. That was the only to date uh, fan request film we've had on this podcast. Uh, I am holding out hope for more one day. And uh, we did it on the show. It's about a Soviet tank group in the yeah, the uh, Afghanistan war who get separated from their people and start going insane in the, in the heat and a mutiny arises. And it's, it's a pretty, pretty fucking cool movie, I gotta say. I haven't seen it, but it looks really good. So I'll have to check it out. I will say, though, the one good thing about the Robin Hood movie is the I'll cut your heart out with a spoon line. I love I don't remember who was asking about it, but somebody was like, why a spoon? And he's like, because it's dull, it'll hurt more. (laughs) He's explaining it to him. That's I think, honestly, that might be my favorite movie quote of all time, because because it's out of nowhere, it's out of place. It's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's got its moments, that one. Uh, I loved it a lot when I was a kid. I had it on tape. I would just watch it all the time. And then I grew up and I watched it again. And I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> <sighs> I love when uh, when Robin looks through a telescope for the first time and he thinks that the bad guys are right in front of him and he takes out his sword no, and takes it. freaks out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Kevin Reynolds did this. He hasn't done much since. Uh, weird. Like he's had a lot of moderate hits, and Waterworld was a pretty big bomb. So I think that set him back pretty bad. Did it really bomb? Oh, it was a huge bomb. Yeah, that that production got out of control really fast because they were filming on water. Like shit sank all the time. Oh my god. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Were they like in? This is probably a dumb question, but were they like in the ocean or were they like in like a, on a set? I think I think it was on on sound stages, but I do think some of it was in the ocean. Uh, I know that like their budget kept increasing to the point where it was starting to get out of control and it didn't make its money back that much. Mm. But uh, I think it's become kind of a cult hit now. I, I've never seen it personally. You've never seen Waterworld? I've never seen Waterworld. Dang, it's it's pretty cool. Like everything looks like exactly what you would think it like it would. Um, like the set designs are perfect. I think the costumes, the vehicles, everything looks like, yeah, oh yeah, this is a planet that is surrounded by water. I mean, it's completely unrealistic. Everyone would be dead, but you know, <laughs> it's really good. Isn't Costner some kind of like mutant guy? Yeah, he has like gills so he can breathe underwater. That's convenient. Oh, and I think he has, does he have webbed feet? Yeah, he has webbed feet too, so he can swim faster. There's a really weird scene where like, you know, because he meets this girl, because the, the plot is there's a girl who has a map tattooed on her back and the map leads to dry land. Uh-huh. But the little girl's mom, um, and they obviously fall in love, but there's a scene where they go under the water and he has to like breathe for her. But I mean, they're basically making out underwater. It's really weird. That's unusual. Uh, <laughs> it was a $175 million budget and it only grossed about 264 million. So they didn't think it was worth the effort. <laughs> what? Yeah. They were hoping for like a blockbuster and they got kind of a moderate success. That's and then just... Costner followed up with the postman, which also tanked. So his super oh, no. status kind of dwindled a bit in the nineties. 
Oh, no. <laughs> um, Jim Caviezel plays Edmund Dantes. Caviezel is most well-known for playing Jesus Christ in the controversial film The Passion of the Christ. Uh, I thought... Me and my me and my dad were talking about um, this movie earlier, and um, my dad said, "Oh yeah, he was in Passion of the Christ." And I don't know why. What movie was Willem Dafoe in? The Last Temptation of Christ. The Last Temptation. That's what it is. Yeah. Because I kept saying, "No, I'm pretty sure I've seen the um, the Passion of the Christ." And I was like, "No, you definitely have not seen that." And then I was like, "No, Willem Dafoe is in it. I'm pretty sure he's Jesus." And then I was like, "No." <laughs> he was like, "Please don't say that on the podcast." <laughs> <laughs> Last Temptation's pretty good. I've I've seen that one. I I liked that one because it shows like Jesus as a as a man faced with this like impossible decision to be a god. And I was like, that's a cool that's a cool idea. Yeah, I like that. This was watch Jesus get fucking tortured for two hours. Oh. And I don't really want to see that. No, no. Uh, but yeah, he was Jesus. Fun fact: while filming, this motherfucker got struck by lightning. Oh my god! And his initials are JC. Yeah, it's almost like God was like, pick a different guy, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> and he needed and he didn't. Oh God. <laughs> Who do you think God would choose to play Jesus? Like what actor today? Well, I, considering Willem Dafoe had a smooth production, I think I think Christ made his choice. Oh yeah. <laughs> In the 80s. Oh my god. <laughs> um, <laughs> some of Caviezel's other films include the thin red line, frequency. The Final Cut, G.I. Jane, and the TV series Person of Interest, where he played John Reese, which ran for a few seasons. I heard that was a pretty decent show. Uh, he's set to play Jesus again in an upcoming Passion sequel titled The Resurrection. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Passion 2, coming soon. I don't think I'll see that. <laughs> I, yeah, I can wait for streaming on that one. Yeah. There's movies, because, you know, I have a feeling, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling it's going to be in the category of movies. I don't know what you call these, but you know, like, um, like God's not dead, like that kind of film. I have a feeling it's going to fit in that category and I don't want to deal with that bullshit, you know? So. Yeah. I just, I just call them like, like God movies. God movies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. You can't make me feel guilty about something I don't care about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's really what it comes down to for me is like, nice try. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh Apparently, he's, like, very into all that, Caviezel. He hasn't really had a big one in a long time because his politics have gotten in the way of his career. Uh, yeah. But it will always be Edmund Dantes to me. Uh, character actor Guy Pierce plays Fernand Mondego. Pierce is mostly known for playing really slimy villains in films like Lawless, Iron Man 3, and Prometheus. And Mondego takes the cake for me. This is the most evil son of a bitch he's ever played. Oh, yes, man. He looks also, I'm trying to say about Guy Pierce, his name fits his face so much. Guy? Like, like he looks like a guy. He does. He looks like a guy. Jim <laughs> looks like a man. <laughs> <laughs> Some of his more heroic roles include Memento, LA Confidential, and The Hurt Locker. And uh, I've always liked Guy Pierce. I always thought he was a very underappreciated character actor. I've seen him oh, in yeah. interviews. He seems like a really cool, nice guy. There's this theme I noticed that like people who play really sadistic villains tend to be pretty nice people in real life. Which yeah. Is cool. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Like um, uh, John Bernthal, the guy that plays Shane in The Walking Dead. Um, my friend, he you know he kept telling me he was like, hey, you gotta like watch his other shit because he's really good. But I can't because I hate Shane so fucking much that yeah. every time I see him, I only think of Shane. But then I watch an interview with him, and he is the nicest guy i've ever seen and it's yeah. weird it's so weird i see i watched um you watch hot ones uh i do but i haven't seen his episode again because i hate shane his is my favorite because he talks about just like his philosophy on life and he has so much fun and he like shouts out so many people he's gotten to work with and just has this energy of like really nice like fun young dad damn fuck okay i guess i gotta watch it <laughs> after this yeah he's a, he's a solid guy uh, <laughs> but yeah, it is. Some people are so good at their craft that you just can't help but see them as that character. And that is very, that's talent right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause I have only seen, every time I see Guy Pierce, I'm like, there's fucking Mondego. <laughs> <laughs> Kings to you, asshole. Like every time. Yep. yep. <laughs> um, Dagmara Dominic, Dominic 
plays Mercedes, Edmund's true love. Uh, and I just want to shout out that uh, to me, she always seems like she's about to cry. Yeah. Do, yes. Yes. She really does. I mean, to be fair, she has quite a lot to cry about. She really does. Yeah. She really does. Um, she was also in Rockstar, The Lost Daughter, Keeping the Faith, and she currently stars on the HBO miniseries We Own This City and the series Succession. So uh, she's doing just fine. But this is the only thing I've ever seen her in. I've, I've yeah, never I, seen her outside of this movie, and I've, she'll always be Mercedes. No. And as, when I was a kid, I didn't know Mercedes was a name. To me, it was just a car. So when I watched this, I'm like, why is she named after the car, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> All you got in order to learn, you must first ask stupid questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I've never seen her in anything. This was the first time I've seen her, but she did. She did really good for the character she had to play. I think she did really good because was, that situation fucking that oh one sucked. My, yeah, to be you know in love and then have that person arrested for treason and nobody can tell you what happened and then you get a letter saying they were executed and his best friend oh. wants to fuck you and you're pregnant and you can't do anything about it so you got to yeah. marry the guy and then he shows up again 13 years later and refuses to admit that it's him yeah, yeah. Too. i was about to say like at first i was like against her i was like because when we find out that she like remarries a month later i was like are you fucking kidding me yeah. but then like henry cavill like as soon as he walked into the door in that scene i was like i was like um i was like already what do you mean he's 16 <laughs> i was like what are you talking about well the What's second on? like as soon as i saw him i'm like that is not mondango's kid <laughs> well yeah because um yeah mondango has blonde hair and then uh edmund and mercedes have black hair yeah so as soon as i saw him i was like oh i was like okay all right i think i know what's going on and then she confirms it later and i was like okay all right good he, she takes quite a long time to tell albert like for non she tells immediately and i like during the i love <laughs> during the scene where she tells albert you can see edmund in the back is like what like he didn't know either <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like well, you're telling him this now <laughs> we'll get to it but yeah there's a lot to unpack here yeah. um oscar nominee richard harris plays abbe faria the priest who mentors edmund in prison Harris was nominated for his performances in 1963's This Sporting Life and 1990's The Field. He was also in Camelot, Unforgiven, Gladiator, The Guns of Navarone, and he played Albus Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter films. Harris died in 2002 at 72 years old from Hodgkin's lymphoma. Wow. And yeah, it's a shame, but this was a hell of a, hell of a swan song for him. I really like Abbe Faria. This is a great character. It really is. It was weird seeing him because, again, the only thing I've seen him in is Harry Potter. And he feels like he is perfect for the first two Harry Potter movies because he feels, this is sound weird, but he feels comfy. Like he feels like yeah. a grandpa. And I feel like that's kind of what Dumbledore was at the beginning. I don't know. Granted, I have, haven't seen any of his other movies, but I don't know if he would have been able to be in the darker movies later on. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really liked him in this movie too. Like I saw him and I was like, holy fuck, that's Dumbledore. <laughs> and they started talking. He started talking, and I was like, like "Yeah, that's Dumbledore, not voice." <laughs> he was a bit of an action star in the seventies, so I really, I can see that happen. I can see him kind of becoming the darker Dumbledore, where Harry, you know, you don't quite trust him because, as we learned, Dumbledore was kind of a shit who lied to everybody. He really fucking was. I've always said I want to find someone who has never seen Harry Potter, so I can like, I want to rewatch it with them but I won't be watching the movie. I'll be watching them watching it. And I just found someone who hasn't seen Harry Potter. I'm so fucking, and they, they haven't read the books either and they want to. So I'm so fucking excited <laughs> to watch, to watch them crumble when they realize that Dumbledore was a horrible person. <laughs> That's cool, man. <laughs> um, if you ever want to see Dumbledore get the shit kicked out of him, watch Unforgiven. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. 19, 1992 Western Harris plays a character named English Bob. Who's like a notorious gunslinger who shows up to this house, like to this town, looking for a bounty. And Gene Hackman, who plays the villain, just beats the living hell out of him in the middle of the town, just like get the hell out of here, <laughs> and just kicks the shit out of him, and he just leaves. So, <laughs> holy shit. Well, yeah. then maybe, yeah, maybe he could have done the darker roles later on. Yeah, but I wonder, like, you switch him, like, could Michael Gambon have done the warm, friendly grandpa Dumbledore? 
I don't know. I don't know. I think he had like moments when he was, you know. Yeah. But um, they're like two completely different. I feel like um, new Dumbledore. This is gonna sound really weird, but maybe you'll get it. New Dumbledore seems like Gandalf. Old Dumbledore seems like Merlin from Sword in the Stone. That is, like, I do get it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, because Gandalf is comfy, but he'll also, like, rip your face off and then turn it into a teddy bear. If you're a fool of a toque, he's going to fuck you up. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and I don't think that's an accident because they first offered the role to Ian McKellen. Like, oh, when, wow, really? For Azkaban, they're like, hey, you want to be Dumbledore? He's like, I'm already Gandalf and Magneto. Give somebody else a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like, look, I'm already, like, on the top of the top. Please. Yeah. I don't need it. <laughs> Which has yeah. got to be cool to say. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in this movie, I love that this, this the guy who shows up in Edmund's cell is like a genius, like scholar soldier who teaches yeah. him everything he needs to, to, to make this happen. Yeah, he got really lucky. <laughs> or was it God? Oh, giving him justice. That's interesting. I will say, though, if I saw a man clawing his way through my floor, I would probably, I don't know. I'd, I'd be very worried. I'm glad that his first instinct wasn't to grab his dinner plate and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Next up, we got character actor Louise Guzman, who plays Jacopo, Edmund's right-hand man, who I, to this day, am amazed he didn't try to kill Edmund and take that treasure. I know. I thought that the entire time. I was like, I was like he's going to betray him, but no. Nope. He's That's literally the- his man until the end. I was like, that's loyalty, man. Oh, yeah. You, he saved him from being buried alive, and Jacopo never forgot that. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I wouldn't either, honestly. I would, I would, I would rather do anything. Yeah. Than After do seeing anything. what this dude's capable of I, he's, and how driven he is by revenge, he's the last guy I want to screw over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, Guzman has over 160 credits to his name as an actor. He's a very prolific character actor. Some of his films include Boogie Nights, Traffic, Punch Drunk Love, Anger Management, and Snake Eyes. And he is set to play Gomez Adams in the upcoming Netflix series Wednesday from Tim Burton. So he's going to be our, our new Gomez. Nice. I've always, I feel like he's that actor where like, have you ever had that actor where you're watching a movie and you're like, oh, he looks really familiar. I mean, I guess, you know, you've done 200 <laughs> of these, so you probably know who everyone is. But like, there's like some people I'll see and I'm like, I'm like, he looks really fucking familiar. What is he in? And then I look up his film, like their film history. And I'm like, oh, fuck, they're in literally everything. I have made it my mission to try and memorize as many of those guys' names as I can. <laughs> so I, I can put a name to the face and really like give them the credit they're due. And uh, yeah, Luis Guzman is a guy I've, I've recognized for a long time. He, he's in a lot of Adam Sandler movies. He's always kind of a goofy guy. So yeah. it's cool to see him in a bit of a serious role here. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, we have a young Henry Cavill who plays Albert, Edmund's son. Uh, Cavill would grow up to be one of the most sought after leading men in Hollywood after he played Superman in Man of Steel. Then he would star in The Man from Uncle, in Nola Holmes, Mission Impossible Fallout, and the Netflix series The Witcher. He's doing just fine. He's so also not, one of the guys in contention for James Bond, most likely. I thought that girl was going to play James Bond. She's not that they're they're rebooting with a new cat, like new cast, new franchise, and all that. Oh, so they're not going to follow her. It's just like canonically, like she's taking up the mantle for a little bit. No, it's. I think what they're going to do is a completely clean reboot, like they do every time there's a new James Bond. Just I act see. like none of that happened, and here we are starting fresh. They do that every 30 something years. <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. I kind of, I don't know. I think Daniel Craig was, is as of, as of right now, the best bond, but you know, that's just my humble opinion. That's uh, it, yeah. I hard to argue with that. He is good. He's one of the few non rapey bonds out there. Which yeah. Is nice. yeah. Uh, or goofy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've always liked James Bond more than mission impossible. Always. Oh, James Bond is the pinnacle of spy action thriller. Like, no one's beaten James Bond. I think another spy movie that I really liked was Kingsman. I didn't like the second one too much, but the first Kingsman was so good. I was getting not like James Bond vibes, but it was like it was like a good mix of, I feel like, Mission Impossible, James Bond, and, you know, humor. It was really good. But I'm not gay, but Henry Cavill. 
He can get I, it. <laughs> there's there's a certain level of attractiveness that transcends <laughs> sexual preference. Yeah. Henry Cavill is one of those people. Yeah, exactly. Like, I haven't seen the second season of The Witcher. And say what you will about The Witcher TV show. I think it's really good because I feel like it's really hard to adapt video games into TV. And I feel like The Witcher does really well because he has like no emotion, which I really like, I feel mm-hmm. like in a video game protagonist. But yeah. I haven't and seen then, the, um, I haven't seen The Witcher. You haven't seen it? It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty good. It's really cheesy, but I feel like that's where they needed to go in order to make this work. Okay. Um, I also think he's a really good super Superman, I think. I don't I, like I, the yeah. writing of the movie, but I like him as Superman. I feel the same way. I think that given the right script and the right like director to nurture that version of the character, he could have been the best Superman. Oh, yeah. But he got Zack Snyder, and here we are. He dropped the ball. Yeah. I don't think he should have killed Zod at the end of the movie. I think they could have done something. Because killing Zod is kind of a big fucking deal. And the fact that he just, like, snaps his neck. I was like, oh. I'm like, really? For me, it was just, like, he sucked all the humanity out of Superman. He made him this, like, weird alien who doesn't quite understand people and is, like, too invincible. Whereas Superman is a... Farm a Kansas farm boy first and an immortal invincible alien second. And that's that's what like the 70s movie accomplished perfectly in the cartoon. But this movie was like, look at this god, worship him. And that's not Superman. That's something that I don't like about most DC DCU movies. Like, because again, I feel like relatability with superheroes is very important. Yeah. And the fact that every DC hero is fighting like gods among gods. Oh, gods beyond gods. I'm sorry. Like that's not relatable. Like it's cool, but it's not like I don't. I don't think it's entertaining. And none it's of them good. mesh well. It never feels like a coherent universe or story because they just they they wanted too much too fast, and now it's just they can't catch up. Yeah, exactly. So I think they're just going to scrap it and just focus on individual stories, which is where they excel anyway. So they should do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think Cavill's ever going to play Superman again. I think he's hung that up. Uh, yeah. But maybe he'll play James Bond. <laughs> That'd be cool. I could see that, honestly. Yeah. Maybe Marvel will snatch him up and he'll play like Hercules or something. <laughs> Ooh, that'd be that'd be cool. I could see that. Yeah. Um, there's more cast members, but those are the main guys. We'll talk more about the rest of them as we go through it. The Count of Monte Cristo has an IMDb score of 7.7, Rotten Tomatoes score of 73%. It grossed 75 million on a budget of 35 million. So for 2002, you know. Not every movie was expected to gross a billion dollars. So that was, that was pretty good. Uh, to a lot of film fans and fans of the book, this remains the definitive version of Dumas' classic tale. Uh, cool. I'll take it. So at one out of 17 tries, this is number one. <laughs> <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, do it 16 more times and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if online I can find a list, like watch Mojo. Like, <laughs> like Top ranking Count of Monte Cristo's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, with that, let's get into the movie. So we start in 1815 France, in a France where nobody seems to speak French, which is funny. I was gonna say, I feel like uh, I ca- there are moments in this movie where I wanted to switch it off English and watch it like in, but then you know, I mean, I was it wasn't like filmed that way, but I kind of wanted to watch it in French, but. It's whatever. Uh, it just makes me laugh that any movie, any American production that features, you know, any European country, it's always mm-hmm. English accents. Always. I feel like, but I feel like they could. They could 100% like make it in French and just give English subtitles and people will watch it. Like, pa- pa- I know Parasite wasn't uh, an American movie, but that movie is still, I think, one of the best movies ever made and it's not in English. I had to read subtitles throughout it and it's still perfect. Well, it's and so it actually made a profit in American theaters. So that, that alone tells you, yeah, that would work. Yeah, it would. Yeah. People would see it. Or at least try at least put on a French accent. I mean, don't go Pepe Le Pew with it, but try. <laughs> I mean, Edmund is, you know, he's, he's an American. Jim Caviezel is an American and he's not even trying to do a British accent. Like, yeah, like it's, they even they even say the words without the French accent. Like he's like, oh yeah, Chateau de Lif. It's like, oh, come on, just say it a little, please. 
My favorite thing is that the character is supposed to be pronounced Edmund Dante. Is it really? Yeah, it's not Dante's, but nobody told Kevin Reynolds and he just rolled with it. (laughs) Oh, God. So they go to Elba, where Napoleon's just been chilling for quite some time. Uh, So I don't don't know my, like, French world history all too well, so I had no... I'm Honestly, I had no idea what was going on at the beginning, but I was like, oh... I was like, is that is that the Napoleon? And then I was like, oh, fuck. Okay, yep, that is definitely Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know a bit. So Napoleon was the emperor of France. Uh, then he lost the re- like a, to a rebellion. And so the entire country didn't go out of control. He wasn't executed. He was exiled to the Isle of Elba, which is like right fucking next to France. So yeah. they were, and then just had people watching him. So inevitably he rolled up to the gates again and tried to take over France again, lost this time, and then they exiled him to a different island. So oh. instead of just fucking killing this guy, <laughs> they just kept pushing him further away from France. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> yeah. But uh, these days, Napoleon's considered one of the greatest military strategists of all time. Oh, yeah. And uh, to some a monster, to others a liberator. He's a complex person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this movie, complete asshole. Oh, yeah. Who ruins Edmund's life. I, I blame him at the top of this pyramid. Yes. He gave him the of, fucking letter, but obviously Edmund can't go get his revenge on fucking Napoleon. Yeah, no, no, that's kind of, that's kind of a big deal. That's a different, that's a different movie altogether. Yeah, <laughs> I would watch that so much. Monte Cristo 2, Bonaparte. The of Bonaparte, <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, during that scene where Napoleon gives him the letter, I was like, I was like, no. I was like, don't do that. I was like, don't take that. What are you doing? The former emperor of France, who was not allowed to contact any of his old cronies, who very much want to see him restored to the throne, is not sending a nice, how you doing letter to an old buddy. That's not happening. Yeah. So I kind of, it's kind of like, he's kind of an idiot. Like, why the fuck would you do that? Well, that's the whole, like, Edmund's too naive for this world. And everyone kind of tells him that. Like, you're you're an idiot. Like, how did you not know that? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, even on like a, right, right when we see him, he shoots a gun in the air to get the attention of the soldiers <laughs> yeah. who are ordered to kill anyone who comes to the. Uh, he did that, and I was like, "That is not how I would get the fucking the attention of military people across the way." What are you doing? And then they then Mondego shoots one of them, and like I don't blame the guy for wanting to take a, a little pound of flesh. Yeah. <laughs> like, assholes just showed up and started hurting my men. Yeah. Now you want our help? Fuck you. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh. So but uh that's before great. they they were literally just, they were just merchant sailors, right? Yeah, they're just yeah, their captain got brain fever and this was the closest uh birth and they're like let's go to Napoleon's island. That's a good idea. And yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, hey, you know, you can't you can do what you can do. Yeah. You have to, so do to what you have. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh my god. Napoleon gives him a letter and he's like if you want my doctor Here's the letter. And then what happens? The guy dies like an hour later. Yeah. I would have left the letter right there. Yeah. I'd be like, well, contract terminated. I'm out of this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, or, or what he could have done is he could have like, he like, oh, fuck, I guess I don't have to do this letter. And then he could have got back to mainland and be like, oh, fuck, I still have this letter. Oh, shit. He kind of just forgot. Yeah. He's like, he oh, no, like, I still have it. It's in my pocket right here. Yeah. Someone was supposed to find me. And apparently Clarion was a little late. <laughs> this was apparently very important, but not that important because he was pretty casual. Yep. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Uh, they get back to Marseille and Danglar is a big old tattletale. <laughs> He's like, hey, he left the ship. He disobeyed me. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing he says when he gets off the ship. <laughs> yeah. The captain is dead and he didn't listen. <laughs> Which, fuck you, honestly, I feel like, I'm going to call him by his correct name, Dante. No, no, I can't do that. Dantes. Dantes, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad he got promoted because that definitely would happen. I feel like for sticking sticking your neck out for captain, I'm pretty sure that's a big deal. So, yeah. yeah. I think if Morel had been a little less cheeky about it to Donglar, things might have turned out differently because... Mm-hmm. Don Glarp took that pretty personally. Yeah. It's really aggressive. He's like, you're going to demote me? And the guy's like, no, you're, 
You're gonna keep your job. He's the boss now, though. Oh yeah, I love. I know this isn't a pirate movie, but I love. I think it's like my inner child. I love pirates and like all things like like ship sailors related. I mean, so I like to be. It kind of is a pirate movie. I mean, it kind of is. Yeah, it's got pirates. It does have pirates. Yeah, it has sword fights. I guess it kind of is a pirate movie. So I, I would call it a swashbuckling movie. There you go. That's what Roger Ebert said. Swashbuckling adventure. Three out of four stars. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's, I feel like, like Three Musketeers, um, Zorro, I think fits in that category. You know, they're all in that, you know, I, 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 don't, I really like the pirate sailor vibe of everything. So I love a good swashbuckler. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Mondego, right, you know, is uh, at when Edmund gets what he thinks is reprimanded. Mondego's like, hey, let's go hang out and wait for him and possibly fuck if things go my way. Dude, well, by the way, can I just say, why the fuck wouldn't you tell your boyfriend, hey, your best friend is like actively trying to fuck me? That is a good question. <laughs> like he says, make love to me. He won't know. I'll know. And then he's like, oh, there he is. Hey, your boy is trying to fuck me. What did she say? First, she says, like, would you stop? As in, like, he does this all the time. <laughs> yes. Like, dude, what are you talking about? Tell him. I think we both know Dantes wouldn't have the balls to actually do anything about it. Not at this point. Not at this point, no. He just stand there and be like, what? No. <laughs> yeah. Give it's the chess piece. Yeah, she tell. <laughs> She tells him, like, I'm not going to be your next whistle because all, you know, Mondego just wants her because Edmund's playing with her. Yep. It's fucking sick. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Dante shows up. is like, I'm new captain. And Mondego's like, well, look who has such a nice life. <laughs> and then <laughs> wanders off. Like, Dude. <laughs> he's going back home to a shack and you are going home to a fucking mansion. What are you talking about? You are next in line to a breadth of of inheritance that you're going to just squander away pretty quickly. But yeah, unreal. And you, um, I think last episode I did, you said you wanted a movie focusing on Mondego and I didn't really understand until this movie. And that would be really cool to watch it like his downfall. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I, I think it's time to do another one. I think it's time for another Monte Cristo. Oh yeah. Yeah. Who would you cast as the, as the two main? <sighs> I would cast, you know what, just, just to be cheeky, I would cast Henry Cavill as Edmund Dantes. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah, yeah, actually, that would work. Uh, hmm. As Mondego, I don't know. I mean, Guy Pierce is so good at being yeah. smarmy and just punchable. And I'd have to have some time to think about who I'd want in that role. Swarm. Maybe, do you think maybe, maybe Willem Dafoe? Maybe, he could be swarmy, I feel like. He's, he's too old, though, like. Jason Bateman. Jason Bateman is Jason. all swarm, man. Like <laughs> maybe Joel Edgerton. Oh yeah, good. he could. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I'd like to think. Of, I, I wonder. I mean, they did the Three Musketeers in 2011, and that was horrible. So I don't see it happening again. I saw it a few years ago and it's like they tried to do what they did here. They stripped it down, took all the drama out and made it more of an action movie. And it just was forgettable. So yeah. I don't see any more Dumas adaptations happening anytime soon. If something happens, if something fails that bad, Hollywood will like cut, like cut ties with anything connected to it for mm -hmm. like a decade. That's like, that's something I don't like. I feel like, Obviously, I know there's a lot of money involved, but there are so many movies I think people want to make. And it's unfortunate that, that if you make a bad movie, you're kind of shunned because mm -hmm. I always feel like people can be redeemed. That's why I love indie movies so much. That's why one of my most anticipated movies right now, this is going to sound really stupid, but one of my most anticipated movies right now is that um, fan-made indie movie that's coming out, the Spider-Man Lotus. It's just being made by a couple of dudes, but it's it's supposed to be huge. Like they're Like they're doing CGI they're doing all kinds of stuff and it, it looks really good. It's, um, it's fan made. Um, and it focuses on the story in the Spider-Man comic books and in the TV show with that kid who's like, he has, I think he has cancer and Spider-Man like talks to him every day or something is focusing on that, focusing on the death of Gwen Stacy. 
But <laughs> now I'm really interested in, in that because you know, obviously they haven't made a bad movie yet. So I don't know. <laughs> they haven't made a movie yet. So yeah, that's cool. I, I like a good fan made film. I found this fan made Joker film on uh, um, YouTube a while back. It was called Joker Rising, and it took place in the Christopher Nolan universe, and it was about how that Joker came about as like from like a low, low life gangster working for the Penguin where like Killer Croc is his like mentor and it's just a big dude with like sharp teeth. Oh my God. And it's about like, he falls in love with a prostitute named Harley and like how it all goes down. It was really good. Holy shit. Yeah. It's still there. Joker rising. There's um, have you played the game? Alan Wake? No, you told me about that though. Yeah. There's a, um, there's a fan made movie TV show about that. And it's just about a guy who's being possessed by the darkness um, I think it's called Bright Falls, and it's really fucking good. Like it's genuinely scary. Sweet. Yeah, when it's done well, like I like when fans can kind of put their own stamp on it. That's why I like when fans are able to get some clout in Hollywood and actually make something that they love. Like 2018's Halloween was yeah. made by fans. It's it's great. And yeah. maybe I don't know. Maybe I got to be the one to make a Monte Cristo movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't hear the uh the property being talked about very often. <laughs> uh so Mondego's upset about, you know, he didn't tell me about a letter, so clearly he's not my friend. And by which by the way, what the fuck are you talking about? The most powerful man on earth gave him a letter and said, Don't tell your best friend. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Where's clearly this is about more than a letter. Yes. Uh, and he tells Don Glar, and they're like, well, let's fuck him up. <laughs> and they tell Villefort that there's a treat, there's a traitor about. And the gendarmes show up and arrest Edmund. And he's like, I demand an explanation. That always makes me laugh, his tone there. Like, it remind me of have you seen the, the, the video of the guy getting arrested? He's like, what was the crime? Eating a meal, a succulent Chinese meal. Have you seen that? I have not, but that sounds funny. <laughs> I don't know why, but that scene reminded me that he was like, what was the crime? What was the crime? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. I love he's I love he tells his dad, like, don't worry, it's a mistake. I'll be back later. I like, know. <laughs> <laughs> Loving that optimism, Edmund. Yeah. He goes to Villefort's house, which again, I'm like, odd. I think yeah. it's his house. It might be his, I don't know. French buildings in 1815 all look the same. House, office, same, same building. Yeah. And- and he's like, so apparently you're a traitor, Dantes. He's like, what? He's, he's like, what like, the fuck are you? Moi? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, uh, what? All I have is this letter Napoleon gave me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like how he didn't fucking lie. I like that about his character. He was like, did you talk to Napoleon Bonaparte? He's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yes. He's like, okay, did anything shady happen? Yes. Yeah. In fact, he gave me this fucking letter right here told me to deliver it to someone did you fucking deliver it no he said someone will find me like what are you doing stop talking boyer up yeah. <laughs> i don't think that was a thing back then but now oh. like, jesus christ yeah. i love when bill is like you know or edmund's like i can't read i swear he told me it was innocent he's like no no you, you're innocent. <laughs> yeah. you, you complete knob. Oh God! <laughs> or you? I was like, God knows how you're going to survive in this world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was so close to getting out of there, dude. I know. He was like, "All right, fine, you can leave." Hey, real quick, who are who? Who's supposed to come get this? Oh, your dad. Oh, word. You're going to go to prison for life. Oh God! <laughs> he burns the letter and is like, "Why don't you?" Take my carriage home. And Edmund doesn't realize he's getting into a fucking. <laughs> what carriage looks like that? Prison carriage. There are iron bars on the on the door. And he doesn't realize until the door closes. He's like, he's like, oh, wait a minute. I love he tries to call him back, like, hey, you made a mistake. Um, hello, sir. <laughs> God. Excuse me. I seem to have gotten into the wrong carriage. Please help me. Oh, it really is amazing how much of a fucking dork he is in the first <laughs> bit of this <laughs> <Yeah>. movie. <laughs> I kept thinking that I was like, this guy is about to go on a ramp on a on a vengeance filled rampage of murder and betrayal. I don't think so. But no, he definitely does. They try to take him to the Chateau Deef, which is a real prison. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is. I was surprised to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that scene where he gets there and he's like, no, listen, I am like genuinely innocent. And the guy's like, oh yeah, I know. Because if you weren't, you would not be here. Anyway, just, I'm going to beat the shit out of you once a year. That Dude, our, Dorliac is such a fucking sadist. Yeah. I love that. He's like, there's any number of prisons they would send you, but this is where they send the ones they're ashamed of. No yeah. one is ever going to say your name again. Yeah. Wow. Which is awful because that means that like he believes him. Like, uh, I, I think you're innocent. Well, that means everybody in that fucking prison is probably innocent. Like, this is where people, you know, troublemakers go. This is your yeah. political prisoners. Say Dumbledore's character is not innocent, <laughs> but well, he wasn't arrested for burning down a church filled with innocent people. He was yeah. arrested for not telling Napoleon where the treasure was. <laughs> <laughs> true, that's true. Oh man! Uh, Poor oh, but, but before that, my, um, Edmund escapes and goes to um, oh, yeah. house and is like, "Hey, I need your help." And he's like, "Nah." <laughs> yeah, I, when he went there, I was like, what are you doing? It's very, very obviously your best friend. He's like, yo, you won't fucking believe this. <laughs> Somebody told the cops that I'm a traitor. And he's like, oh, really? Wow. Are you being followed right now? I do love what he's like. I didn't tell you about it because he told me not to tell it. Somehow the authorities found out. Like, yeah. you, you're, not, you're not good at putting clues together, are you, Edmund? <laughs> He's like, no, I read the letter. How? <laughs> How did he not wake up when he read the letter that night, by the way? <laughs> like, I, I think it's, I, I love when he's like, do you have money? Do you have a pistol? He's like, no, good. And he slices him with a sword. <laughs> yeah. And Edmund's like, stop it. We don't have time to play. Yeah. He's like, he's like, fuck off. This isn't the time to joke. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. What and a then, fucking dork, man. I love that he keeps trying to attack Fernand with no sword, and Fernand just keeps poking him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now, you know, the one person he thought he could count on destroyed him. Yeah. So he ends up in Chateau Deef. Something yeah. about that just sounds so fucking bleak. Yeah, Chateau, Chateau Deef. <laughs> uh. You can go there. Like, you can take a tour. Still there. Really? Yep. I was looking at it. Like, it opens at 10 a.m. And you can oh. go. You can go take a tour, and they have like the the cell that inspired the Count de Monte Cristo and all that. Like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty neat. Is I it like it was in the movie? Like, do they really have like just like a hatch for food? And yeah, that was that was prison in the eighteen in eighteen tens. It was just you had, you were in a dark stone hole. You got one meal a day. No water. They never give them any water. Oh fuck! And they just rot. <laughs> it's really twisted. I always wondered how, because um, Edmund's cell has literally nothing in it except for his, you know, his bucket and his bowl. Yeah. But Abe's cell has a fucking table. Has he's got books? He's got candles. Yeah. I was like, how? I was like, what's going on? Like, how? Why? I always thought that they were kind of taking the carrot rather than the stick approach with with Abe when they're like, hey. We give you these amenities. Maybe you'll tell uh, us where the treasure is. Like, where's the treasure? So, like, so instead of just beating them up once a year, just because they beat them up once a year, to figure out where the treasure is. Yeah. Okay. I think so. I don't know, but uh, I love Dorliac's whole. He says one of my one of my favorite cold ass lines ever. When Edmund's like, you know, God is everywhere. Like, he, he will help me. And Dorliac's like, well, let's make a deal. Yeah. You you ask God for help, and I'll stop the minute he shows up. Yeah. Jesus. Dude. <laughs> Uh, because like I don't like I don't care if you believe in God, but um, he's not going to show himself to you in that moment. There's no way. No, no. there's like literally like even even you know yeah okay God exists. He he's not going to do anything in that time in that moment. No, he's still helping Richard Harris dig that hole. <laughs> <laughs> he's busy right now. <laughs> he's a little busy. What does he say? God is never in France this time of year. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Uh, and I do find it ironic that he is saying all these things to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I uh, always thought that the uh, what, uh, Armand is that name? Yeah, Armand. Mm-hmm. He reminded me of Lord Farquaad. I don't know why. I think it was the hair and his face structure. Oh yeah, Michael Wincott definitely has has that vibe. He was in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Oh, he was a uh, guy of Gisborne, sheriff's cousin that he just stabs in the gut randomly at one time. <laughs> Who the fuck names these people? Guy of Gisborne. What? You know how many guys live in Gisborne? 
<laughs> Have you ever seen um Robin Hood Men in Tights? Is that the one with um Buck? What's his name? Man? Princess Bride. Yeah, Carrie Elwes. Yeah. What's his name? Carrie Elwes. Carrie Elwes. Yeah. I have not, but I heard it's pretty funny. It's I like it. It's he mocks Costner the whole goddamn movie. Good. But during the wedding scene with the sheriff of Nottingham and Marion, we learn the sheriff of Nottingham's name is Mervin. <laughs> and the priest just keeps making fun of him the whole time. <laughs> it's like, okay, Mervin, let's continue. <laughs> Do you, Mervin, <laughs> take this lid? It's so funny. <laughs> That's fucking great. Uh, but yeah, people have weird names. Especially yeah, yeah. in 1850s France, where no one spoke French. Oh, yeah. Armand Dorliac has an English accent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of Princess Bride, that's definitely in my top 10, I think. That movie oh, so. I love The Princess Bride. That is a perfect movie. Yes, it is. I can get 10, 10 out of 10. Oh, yeah. Straight up. Um, I found out today, fun fact real quick, I was reading on Cracked, uh, Wallace Shawn, who played Vizzini, the little guy with the Battle of Wits, his agent told him that he only got that because Danny DeVito was busy, and he it got into his head and really made him second guess his performance the whole time. I kind—I mean, for that character, I feel like that, that works. Yeah, it makes him kind of secretly insecure while projecting this idea of like I'm the smartest guy in the room, but I don't really believe that. Like I yeah. thought it worked. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Very cool. And man, Inigo Montoya is such a well-written character like he's so fucking i love oh my god i could talk about just a scene with um uh fuck luck what's his name lucky sam i don't know the the guy where they try to bring oh um miracle max miracle max yeah. lucky sam what the fuck yeah when, <laughs> when they try to bring wesley back to life he's like no 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 he's half dead <laughs> he's not full dead God, man, that movie's so fucking good. I could talk about it all day. I think my favorite line is when Vizzini's like, take he's he's talking down Inigo and Fezzik, and he's like, "When I found you, you were so slobbering drunk, you couldn't buy brandy." <laughs> I don't know why, but I always love that line. <laughs> oh god, I love Andre the Giant. Oh, I, I can't wait to do that movie on the show. It would be so much fun. You haven't done it. We've not done Princess Bride. That doesn't happen. Oh yet. shit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Dantes spend the, the next just decade sitting in a stone room thinking about vengeance and losing faith in God. It's rough. He had to go crazy, like a, like a little bit because like, he, tries, you, he tries to kill himself at one time, but he can't do it. Yeah. He keeps trying to, he keeps, you know, there's a, the last guy in there wrote, God will give me justice on the wall. And he keeps making it, you know keeping it alive. But then at one point he just drops the rock and he's like, yeah, no I, I thought that's how they were. Um, I thought they were going to change the escape from the book. I thought that's how he was going to escape. I thought it was going to be like a Shawshank type situation. I thought he was going to go through the wall because he mm -hmm. realized, Oh shit, this wall is soft. I can carve through this, but then you only have a fucking year to do that. And uh, that's not possible. Would have been hilarious if he had like, there's a door that goes in there and Dantes isn't there. But there's like a poster of Joan of Arc. <laughs> he lifts it and there's a hole. <laughs> He's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> a poster. <laughs> oh, yeah. How do you tape this up? Tape hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is an immaculate painting. I love when he's uh when he's getting whipped and Dorliat calls him Danton. He's like, what is his name again? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Just, well, he's that. He's not even a little bit important to anybody. <laughs> I'm surprised that they just let prisoners be for a whole year. It's not like there weren't human rights in 18 in the 1820s. No, no, but like, I wonder how easy it was to escape those prisons back in the day. I don't know if they were harder, easier. I don't know, but I'm sure there are definitely more attempts because you're left alone for so long. That's true. I get, and their, but their whole deal is like, all they got to do is keep you alive. So like they feed you, they don't need yeah. to entertain you or keep, like see if you're sick or anything. As long as you're eating, they don't give a shit. Yeah. So a lot of people were just like too malnourished to even try, mm. which is a shame, but there were, you know, there's some, I'm sure there were some prison breaks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
And Abbe Faria comes through the ground. And at first, Dantes freaks the fuck out because his floor is moving. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, my God. And I would have think I've, I was going crazy, honestly. Yeah. Out pops Albus Dumbledore, and now he's got company. You're a wizard. No. <laughs> I love he's like, can I stand on your shoulders? Because he hasn't seen the sky. Yeah, I like that. Years. Jesus. Can't imagine. Hmm. Uh, I love when he, he lays out his plan. He's like, there are two ways to dig through this, through this place, and I chose the wrong one. It's like, oof. Yeah, that's, that's sad. Yeah. And he tells, I want to know, did he ever say how long he was digging for first time? Yeah, he said uh, five. Five years, I think. Oh, fuck, man. Yeah. And how long had Dante's been there at that point? I guess uh, four? Four years, maybe? I don't know. I don't know when around, he, I don't know when he met Faria in terms of his imprisonment. I don't remember that. But total, he was there 13 years, and they spent a good eight years digging the tunnel. Yeah. So, so six years. Okay, yeah, we'll say six years. Man, that's a lot of fucking commitment. Eight years. And what did he say? He said three, three inches a month? Holy fuck. Well, I love Dante's laughs, and Faria makes a good point. Like, what, do you got something else to do? <laughs> yeah. Do you got a depressing yeah. appointment? <laughs> He's like, yeah, we should be done in about eight years. <laughs> when he offers him, like, if you help me, I will teach you everything I know. You know, economics, mathematics, how to read and write. And Edmund gets a pretty sweet deal there. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. Right now, if someone offered me that, no. But I guess, you know for what he needed to accomplish and in this time period education really was pretty important but uh, i don't want to fucking learn about economics fucking politics well, i mean if i'm sitting in a hole with literally guess, nothing yeah. to do i will take anything i will learn the word of christ i don't care oh damn <laughs> yeah okay yeah fair enough i guess anything to keep the mind busy yeah yeah it's either that or you go insane like when i love when he's he says, like, there's 72,000 stones in my walls. I've counted them many times. And he's like, but have you named them yet? Yeah. And he just starts crying. <laughs> <sighs> oh, boy. So, yeah, the next bit is them digging the tunnel. And we get this montage. And Edmund's learning. And they're digging. And they're making progress. And uh, he points, Edmund points out that this guy was a, a, a soldier. So he tells him. Help me, Martin, teach me how to fight or I'm leaving. Yeah, which, which honestly is, <laughs> that's a pretty big threat. And I go, fuck, please don't. Yeah, it's like, you're the only human being I've spoken to in a decade. Yeah, I need you. I really liked, I know that basically the entire prison scene is a one long montage, but I <laughs> like, I've, I really like when um, movies have this kind of montage where it's broken up, you know, instead of like the shitty, like, smash mouth playing where it's like you know very quick like three second scenes like have you seen zoom yeah with tim allen mm -hmm. i hate that fucking movie because it's 95 percent montage like all of those garbage but this movie did montage really well i want i want somebody to re-edit this thing so that the prison sequence is like tuned to like danger zone by kenny loggins or something <laughs> No, man, no. <laughs> or better yet, how about Down in a Hole by Allison James? Oh no. <laughs> but yeah, I love the I love seeing their progress and then when they find the roots and they're like, we're we're almost here, and they fuck yeah. up and cause a cave in. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I haven't I didn't think about that until like dust started falling. I was like, oh shit, like this could tumble on top of you and you will die. I'm I'm to a degree pretty claustrophobic, so I don't I don't think I could do that. Yeah, no. Oof. I um. I wish that they had noticed. Like I know, like he, you know, he has to escape, and I'm glad he escaped. But just to add a little more tension. I wish that they would have noticed that his bowl was missing, like when they walk in, because because it zoomed in on the bowl still being down in the in the hole. Mm -hmm. So I wish, like, when they had gone into the cell, realized he was dead. Like, wait, where the fuck is his bowl? Like. There is literally nowhere this could have gone. Where the fuck is it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That would have been interesting. I also noticed that, like, when they learn how to fight, they take the stick, like, they take pieces of the door out. Yeah. And I'm like, 
you could probably break that thing down. Like, and you could leave now. <laughs> like, no one's monitoring this place. You could clearly just walk out the front door <laughs> if you just wait till the food guy passes you and then just yeah. go. <laughs> Whatever. No, oh, maybe left. I like the um, the water thing. How he was like karate chopping the water. Yeah, I'm like, that felt very like uh, kung fu movie. Was was seventy year old like cancer sufferer Richard Harris moving that fast? I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but still, cool idea, and it did aid Edmund uh, when the priest dies and tells him, you know, I lied about knowing where the treasure was. And he's like, you lied? I love he's like, yeah. I'm a priest, not a saint. I love that line. Dude, that was such a cool line. Like, because it comes back later, which we'll talk yeah. about later. But that was, there's so many lines in this movie where I'm like, Dan, that was gold. <laughs> this movie, does the script does a great job translating like kind of a slightly unpalatable, you know, 1800s dialogue to a modern audience while still maintaining the uh, vibe and tone of the story and that, that's hard to do i always i always love thinking about that because i like to think that personalities obviously people's attitudes in society have changed personality wise i don't think people have really changed which means that like mozart drops an album and you know that they're sitting there back home being like damn this shit hard but you know like <laughs> you know i i think about that every time i hear about like an ancient roman dick joke that they find yeah. I'm like, we've always been the same kind of dopey idiots. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But you know that like someone's reading this, you know, back in the in, in the 1800s and they're like, damn, <laughs> like that's cold. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, so now Edmund has a treasure map and <laughs> he's like, you must use it for good. And, and Dantes is like, no, I'm going to use yeah. it for revenge. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, Okay. Which, again, I like that. I, I don't hate when movies have characters change, but I always feel like it's done so much. And I'm so glad that they didn't in this movie. Like, he kept he kept with the fact, no, I want revenge. And I'm not going to let anyone change that. No. I also like, um, well, I guess we'll talk about when he actually escapes in a second. But I like that they, I'm glad that he didn't be like, all right, I guess I'm going to continue digging this hole alone. Because that would have been, I feel like, boring, I feel like. But he was like, no, I, I, I got to get out like now. Well, he had this moment of like, you know, you're free. I'll never be free. And then he like looks at the corpse. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes. He's like, I have an idea. <laughs> Which, by the way, fucking wild. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know what's funny? I watched The Mask of Zorro last week, another movie I love. Mm. The exact same fucking thing happens in The Mask of Zorro. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Anthony Hopkins hides a recently dead body. Just got, you know, goes in the bag and escapes that way. I'm like, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Still a good movie. Yeah. Uh, I love when the guys come in and that the food guy is almost a little remorseful. He's like, first time in 12 years, he hasn't said thank you. Yeah. He's like, aw. Aw. The other guys are like, looks dirty. <laughs> they're like, well, they're all dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they usually are. <laughs> See, that's that's what I'm talking about. Like, well, where's his bowl? Oh, well, he's dirty. You know, I mean, I feel like I feel like they could have connected the dots. But they could have, have, they could have. But I mean, would it have really? I mean, the reveal of you know the the body in Dante's cell was was bigger. I feel like. Oh yeah, hundred yeah. uh, percent. He he acted pretty damn fast though, dragging the corpse through the hole. Like, that was, yeah, he was fast as fuck. Yeah, good timing. What I would have done is I would have put my food bowl on the on the other side of the hatch. That way, they wouldn't have found my body. I love the food guy. Like, if there's not the plate, his reaction is like, to kick the door and scream, like, let's have it. <laughs> That's what he does. Yep. That's funny to me. I love when he locks the door and the guy's like, why'd you lock it? He's not going anywhere. <laughs> just so we don't ask, well, why didn't Edmund just go through the door? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so Dorlea comes out to inspect the corpse. Edmund's in the sack. They're walking out. Dorley acts like, God, I'm bored. <laughs> that made me laugh. Like, all this dude does is just live on this prison island and whip yeah. people. No, he's like, come on, I don't have all day. And then he's like, wait, actually, I do. <laughs> he's like, I have all the time in the world. I have literally nothing better to do. <laughs> I wonder who he pissed off. 
to end up as the warden of Chateau Deef because he's clearly being punished too. He is, but he's a sadist. He's he's a sadist. Like he's he's an asshole. She deserves to be there, but I wonder. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if he like. I wonder if he pissed off Napoleon. I don't know. I feel like anybody pissed off Napoleon ends up getting some kind of comeuppance in this movie. Oh yeah. Uh, I love when Edmund goes over the cliff and grabs Dorley Atkins. He goes with him. <laughs> oh, that's great. And that's the first vengeance he gets. He fucking snaps Dorliak's neck. Oh, satisfying. I just, okay, so I have, this is like way off topic. Well, it's not on topic. It's still on the movie. But um, in the movie later on. So um, when they go to the casino, I remember thinking like, oh, shit, did they really have casinos back in the day? And then that made me think about like the Romeo and Juliet movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, which made me think about the, um, the um, Great Gatsby movie. Baz Luhrmann, I feel like, could make a really fucking cool remake of this movie. Mm, I don't With know. With like, because I didn't really like, uh, what's that movie he made? Uh, fuck. It was all space. Oh, Valerian. I didn't really like that. But I feel like with like modern music. Was that Baz Luhrmann? Who did Valerian? I think so. I thought that was yeah. Luke Besson. Let me look that up. It might have been Baz Luhrmann. Valyrian and the City of a Thousand Planets. That's an ambitious title that I, I feel is not going to deliver regardless of what the movie's about. Uh, yeah, Luke Besson. That, that's the guy who did the fifth album. Oh. Huh. I don't know why I thought it was him then, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like I like that Romeo and Juliet movie, and I like the Great Gatsby movie. Um, just because I there's no other movie like it. Like, yeah, I, feel, I feel like it's weird, like modern music with old-timey shit. See, but I don't want that done to the Count of Monte Cristo. I don't want to see this in like 1990s LA. Like, I want to see, yeah, yeah, yeah like, like don't don't set it in that time. Just have, I don't know, just the way that I don't know. Well, maybe. I, Lerman's so hit or miss. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait till I see Elvis to really make my decision on him as a filmmaker. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Did you like the Greg Gatsby movie? Not really. I I liked some of the performances, but honestly, I don't still think it's a very good story. Yeah, I've never really liked the story. I don't. I really like the soundtrack, and I really like um, Tobey Maguire's performance in that movie. And as always, I mean, I guess I'm a fanboy, but Leonardo DiCaprio, I think, never fails to deliver. Like, yeah, I'll go with you on that. I don't think I, I've never met anyone who wasn't a fan of Leonardo DiCaprio. He's one of the most talented actors of yeah. our generation. Uh, yeah, talented guy. He'd be a good Mondego. Yeah, he would. Because mm. I've seen, like, <laughs> you watch, like, Django Unchained. Like, he can play evil very well. He can play anything, man. <laughs> he can play evil. He can play very sweet and heroic, kind-hearted people. He can play <laughs> creepy. He anything. He can play the fucking dope, as we see in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I haven't seen that yet. I have to watch it. Oh, dude, it's great. Is it on your voodoo? Because if it is, I will watch it when we're done. It is on my voodoo, yes. I will watch it, yeah. I love Tarantino so fucking much. This was fun. This is Tarantino doing 60s LA and the Manson murders. It's fucking awesome. Manson's in it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Half the movie is about the Manson family. <laughs> oh, damn. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. Um, that's a fucking great movie. <laughs> so Dante's escapes. I love the one guy up up on the cliff. He's like, we could have handled that a bit better. <laughs> yeah, this is what I mean. Like this movie is so good in the way that it delivers its funny lines because it is believable. Like in M like in MCU movies, the humor is you know believable because obviously they're gonna joke to lighten the mood when things are awful. But you can always tell that like, jokes are written into MCU movies. But this yeah. movie, it feels very natural. Like of course he would joke about that because. He's a guard on an island doing nothing. Who I'm pretty sure all of them are pretty damn jaded when it comes to violence. So yeah. this is kind of like, ha. <laughs> 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 kind of funny to them. They're like, guy escaped. Dorliac's dead. Who's getting a promotion? Exactly. Like in my job, like I work in the medical field. When I get shit on my clothes from another person, I'm like, ha Guess I have to go change. <laughs> like it's part of the job. Got to see the humor in things or else you're going exactly. to go insane. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I love when Dantes washes up on the beach right in front of pirates. <laughs> like, yeah. Fuck. When I first saw this, I'm like, oh no. 
Because in the book, I'm pretty sure that he gets their attention by sailing really well. And they're like, yeah, he'd be good. Yeah, but I kind of like the whole, you know, I have a dilemma. You are a perfect way yeah. to help me out of this. This guy tried to steal from me. I don't want to seem weak. So fight him in the night fight. If you win, you get to be on the boat. If not, well, nice knowing you. Which I agree with 100%. <laughs> yeah. I love when Dantes is like, well, what if I win and I don't want to be a pirate? He's like, well, we'll just kill you and that'll be that. <laughs> yeah. He's just so matter of fact about it. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. I love that guy. Luigi Vampa is one of my favorite characters because he's like the most even keeled pirate I've ever seen in a movie. Yes. <laughs> he's so agreeable to everything. Have you seen um, Our Flag Means Death? Not yet. I want to. I've heard it's really good. <laughs> Blackbeard is fucking great in that movie because he's basically like that. He's like, he's like, yeah, cool. All right. I guess we'll do that. <laughs> but I mean, Our Flag Means Death is, is, is it's basically a gay pirate romance TV show. They're trying to like be nice pirates, right? Like kill them with kindness is their whole thing. Yes. Well, that's what, that's what, um, what's his name? He, he was a real dude. I don't know. The guy that becomes friends with Blackbeard in the, in the TV show. But yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't, I don't know a lot of pirate history, but I'd like to. Uh, yeah. And Jacopo loses the fight, but Dantes manages to get him to, you know, uh, he saves his life and Jacopo's like, I am yours. I thought he was going to tell him like, like when he grabs him when they're on fighting and he's like, he's like, listen to me. I was like, oh, is he going to be like, I'm going to kill you one day? Cause he was very intense. He was like, I owe you my life. <laughs> and he was like, I know. It's funny. Like loyalty, all the, all the seemingly bad people in this movie are very loyal to a fault, but all the like stereotypically good people, like the magistrate or royal or nobility or the prison warden are s- like complete assholes who yep. manipulate for their own ends. And I, I like that, that kind of plays into, into this yep. movie. It's all money. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe none of these pirates betrayed his ass for that giant cache of gold. Like none of them. They're all just like, you got to go find that treasure. It's your destiny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you'd think if Vam- if Luigi found out that this new guy had a map to the greatest treasure the world had ever seen. He would kill him so quickly. So do you think he told, like, he had, he had to tell him, right? Like, hey, I have this, I think he kept it a secret. Well, he tell, like, when they get to Marseille. Oh, yeah. Papa tells him, like, you know, you can't, like, whatever you're after, it's not on this ship. You need to go face what, what happened to you. Like, so I think he told them the story. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah. He might have left out the massive treasure, which was a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, or or maybe he didn't. Maybe he just told them a story, and then maybe they respected that so much. They're like, "Yeah, get out of here." Well, yeah. no, I don't think he did because he said, "Oh, you've never been here." When they get to the Marseille, he's like, "Oh, you've never been here." That's right. I guess he told them like the highlights. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, when he tells him the quote, like you know, in life we're all either kings or pawns, and he's like, "Who told you that?" It's like, Napoleon. He's like, "Yeah, okay, sure." <laughs> well, that- He's like, no, no, really. I'm like, fucking. <laughs> Which I really like the theme of kings and pawns in this movie, especially with that king piece that, you know, they get thrown around between the two. Yeah. I love that whole concept of king of the moment that they have. Yeah. yeah. Good way to live your life. Like, mm-hmm. celebrate those moments. And to be completely honest, I feel like Dante's needed to be king in the moment throughout his journey of becoming the count. Oh, yeah. yeah. He tells Jacopo, go find a boat. He goes and talks to his old boss, finds out some highlights, like his true love married his worst enemy. And it's like, fuck her. He immediately goes straight to that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> who is it that he spoke to? I don't, I don't, re- I'm really bad with like faces. Who was that that he went to go talk to? That was Morel, the, the boss he had. Okay, who, that's who made what I thought. Captain. Yeah, that was him. And I like how he, he was like, he was like, hey, Morel. And then he like brushes the hair out of his face and he's like, what? <laughs> and he's like, I guess fucking nothing. <laughs> it's like, yeah. where is he? Well, it's a good point. Like in the days before photographs, like if you haven't seen somebody's face for 13 years that you were told is dead. Yeah. That face is going to fade. Yeah. Especially with longer hair and, you know, facial hair. He definitely yeah. has to look more, I would assume more rugged tan. He's been a pirate for what was it? It was, it said three years later. Mm-hmm. He hung yeah. around with them for three years. That'd be a fun movie. Um, yes. 
But I, love, I want more pirate movies. There's not enough. Like Pirates of the Caribbean is great, but I want, I want more. It did monopolize the subgenre big time. Yeah. I think it's uh, very telling about Mercedes' character that she's the only one who immediately recognized him. Yep. Yeah. I like that. And mm-hmm. I like that she didn't... I was worried that she was going to blow the whole thing like as soon as she saw him. In fact, I had the movie playing in the background and that scene is happening right now. Like, <laughs> right now. Like, she she sees him. And every like when I saw this, I was like, please don't say something stupid. Be like, oh my God, it's you. Oh my God, she screams Edmund. Mondego <laughs> spits out his drink. Does a double take. Is like, oh my God. <laughs> like, oh, shit. Exactly. Yep. He's immediately arrested for escaping the Chateau d'If. <laughs> Which, by the way, <laughs> he still escaped prison. Like, he has to have people looking for him. No, yeah, because as far as they know, you know, like everyone was told Edmund Dantes was arrested and executed. Oh, that's true. He was executed. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, man. That is true. <laughs> uh, so, wow. Dantes really did die on Chateau de Lif. Yes, he did. And who came out? The Count of Monte Cristo. Yeah. They go to the island. They follow these clues. They go to Elephant Rock and they, they comes back with like a hundred chests of gold. Dude, <laughs> there is no way that that much gold was hidden for that long. He's like, oh yeah, this entire boat is full of gold and there are eight more boatloads. He doesn't have to work the rest of his life. He doesn't need anything. He's fine. Yeah, and I guess that's why Jacopo doesn't try to kill him. He's like, I am set for life too because my best best friend is the Count of Monte Cristo. (laughs) Yeah. Which is is Monte Cristo, it's a real place, right? Yeah, it's a real island. It's also a very popular sandwich. Yeah, I kept thinking about that throughout this movie. I was like, man, I want one. <laughs> I would love if this ended with him like, you know, revenge is, is over. So he invests everything into this new sandwich idea he had. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you get the French toast. <laughs> it's funny. I love the introduction of the count, the music, the majesty. The, the invitations, the mystery, yeah. even you're like, what, what it has he become? Yeah. I love when Jacopo buys that guy's house. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm going to buy your house. And he's like, all right, bitch, get the fuck off my property before I kill you. And then he <laughs> opens it and all the gold. And he's like, oh, fair enough. The very cheek. I love that. <laughs> the very also, che- like, there's no way he counted all that gold. He, he doesn't know if he's getting equated value here. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, some of those rubies looked fake. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and they all show up except for Mondego, who can't be bothered because he's currently off killing his lover's husband. Yep. And the Which counter- I, I like that small scene. And then he goes back inside and Mercedes is like, hey, did you just kill that guy? And he's like, uh, yeah. Which I like because it just shows that Mondego has become, he literally doesn't give a shit about anything anymore but himself. No, he's, he's very like reckless and yeah, he's been fucking around on her for their entire marriage and is open about it and flouting it in front of her. And Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's like, I mean, like, what did he say? He said, we live in Paris. Like, obviously, I'm going to cheat on Paris you. and me is hardly a recipe for fidelity. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, what are you doing? <laughs> You're a fucking asshole. Don't screw the Joker sequel. We need a Mondego movie. <laughs> yeah. I would love... He survives the end of the movie, but has a massive, like, wow, I was a real asshole. Come to Jesus moment. <laughs> like, I would love, like, a redemption movie. But then in the end, he just goes right back to what he was doing because yep. you can't change this kind of asshole. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Count arrives in a hot air balloon surrounded by fireworks. And I'm like, this could have been over really fast. Oh, that was, yeah. That wasn't smart, Edmund. <laughs> Not at all. I love that scene, you know, the build up, you know, he fireworks, hot air balloon. And he was like, I present to you the Count of Monte Cristo. And then he walks up to the edge. He's like, hi. And then he just leaves. Well, everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> like, who is whoa. this guy? <laughs> yeah. He just walks up. He's like, greetings. And then walks away. <laughs> and that's it. I was in that party and I saw some guy I've never heard of who was apparently the richest dude on earth. <laughs> 
shows up in a hot air balloon with like trapeze artists and this yeah. like an orchestra or something I'm assuming was there. I don't know. <laughs> and he just walks out in this like, I also noticed he has one outfit he wears through the whole rest of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but he just shows up, says one word. I'm going to be like, I need to know everything because yeah, 1820s are boring. So what is this? Yeah. And he introduces himself to Villefort and Villefort and his wife are like, what do we know? <laughs> yeah. Immediately. They're like, all right, how can we, how can we play this dude? Mm-hmm. His wife was uh, the late Helen McCrory, by the way. Didn't uh, realize that. Oh. Yeah. Narcissa, uh, Draco's mom. Oh shit. Mm-hmm. Damn dude. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. And then Vilfor played um, Azrael on Gotham. I have not seen Gotham. It's you, I, you don't have to. Yeah, I just can't. I don't. I don't like it. I don't like Kid Batman. I know he becomes Batman at the end, but like how? Because he's still like sixteen at the end, isn't he? Yeah, uh-huh. he's still a, he's a fucking kid in a bat costume. So like how? So are they just like rewriting the canon? Like Batman is now sixteen in Batman. I don't know. I don't it, know. it literally looks like a child going to like trick or treat. That's awful. It was, yeah, it was rough. I've heard that. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the actor that plays the Joker or Jerome. I heard yeah. he did pretty good. Cameron Monaghan did decent, Cameron Monaghan. but he got some shit writing towards the end. They're just like, yeah. "Here's my twin brother." Nobody ever talked about. And I hate that shit so much when they do that in the movie. Oh yeah, I'm. Um, he's a really good actor. Honestly, mm-hmm. I love him in. Um, even in in the in the Star Wars video games, he's really good. And I I can't wait for the new Star Wars game to come out because he is Jedi so well. Like, yeah, I, I enjoyed Fallen Order. Oh yeah. So what was it? What was it when then it was called uh, Jedi Survivor? Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be fun. Which. Why don't they talk about him in the movie? Because he's that's kind of a fucking big deal. The shit that he's going through, like that's huge. Yeah, and that's canon according to Disney. Everything that's come out since the buy the, the buyout is is canon. He has to. He's going to be in a movie at some point. I'm sure he'll pop up on one of the Disney Plus shows. Yeah, probably. I don't think he's big enough for a movie, but he will show up on one of those shows at some point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The count is like, where is Mondego? And Nakapo's like, he's not here. <laughs> Shit. He's like, I fucking did all this <laughs> for nothing. Yeah. He's like, all right, what do we know? Well, he's losing money. Like, what if he's like, it's by the bank? Yeah. <laughs> no more. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the invitations that are sent out to go to the party, they're very well done. I feel like a little too well done for the time period, but I guess, you know, richest man in the world, you know, they, they look like, they looked like my prom invitations in high school. Like they were really well done. Yeah. Apparently, you know, you can do, you can get anything when you're the richest man on earth. I mean, you can literally just go buy a bank to piss somebody off. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Jesus. And uh, we learn about Albert, who is a young Henry Cavill who wants to go to Rome. And mom's like, no. And dad's like, fuck off, go to Rome, leave me alone. <laughs> Awful, man. <laughs> Uh, he goes to Rome. Monte Cristo pays his pirate friends to kidnap Albert. I love that whole scene. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad they understood the assignment. Like, it's a fake kidnapping. Don't really hurt this kid. <laughs> uh, and that's a great way to endear the Mondegos to the Count and get the Count to their house. That was smart. It was very smart. I like how every single thing works out for Edmund. And everything is meticulously thought out and planned. Even um, later on, when um, when Mercedes and Mondango are at that dinner, he like does a little hair twirl thing, and I know that was intentional. I know he did that on purpose. I always thought that was the one like the one moment of like screw up in his plan. Like it was an impulsive tick, and that uh, was what Mercedes like. Oh my god, it, it is him. I always thought that was unplanned, but you might be right. Because I think, I don't know, because I, uh, I don't know, because that, that is true, because at that point, he wanted revenge on Mercedes also, because he didn't know that she was pregnant, and that's why she married Mondego. Yeah. And he really lets her have it. He's like, so how long did you wait? She's like, hey, that's not fair. And he's like, please leave. <laughs> yeah. He's like, all right, 
we're gonna get the fuck out of my carriage. <laughs> uh, he even like he he tricks Albert into hearing something about gold, so that yeah. he'll tell his dad. That was so fucking good, man. <laughs> like at first, I was like, I was like, oh fuck, I was like, no. Like when uh, when when Dago and Villafort are like planning. He was like, oh, yeah, my son overheard. I was like, no. I was like, fuck, it's all going to fall apart. And I was like, wait a minute. No, it's not. This is the Count of Monte Cristo. He fucking planned that shit. He's been thinking about every aspect of this for a decade and change. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nothing is going to be left to chance. Yes. And I'm so glad that they didn't do that. Because I feel like movies, you know, they want to add in like suspense. with so like, oh, maybe your plan fails a little bit. But no, man, it wouldn't because he's been planning this for years. Well, and also for half a movie, we as the audience have been watching Edmund just fucking eat it. <laughs> so yeah. it's nice to see him get a win for a change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he tells, you know, he closes all of Andego's like shipping stuff. So he has to go back to Donglar and he knows that's going to get fucked up. And then Bill is getting sucked into this. Everyone is where they need to be. Mm-hmm. And that is just really cool. I love when Deville Four is like, I require 70%. Mondego's like, weird, and you're only going to get 50. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Smarmy that's, asshole. That's another one of the lines where I was like, damn, that's cold. But yeah. <laughs> ah, so good. So he gets Dangalar first, sets him up for theft, and then basically hangs him in front of the cops. <laughs> yeah. Fuck, man. And then he's like, cut him down before he can't speak. Yo. Who, who are you? I'm the Count of Monte Cristo, but my friends my call friends me Edmund Dantes. Edmund Dantes. Yo. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, God, man. Jeez. I like how, um, oh, shit, in that scene where, um, first of all, Jacob. Jacob? Yeah. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. He, like, sees him sleeping on the floor. He's like, did you fall out of bed? And he's like, no, after 13 years of sleeping on stone, I cannot sleep in bed anymore. And then he sees his back and he's like, hey, does that still hurt? <laughs> I, I feel like Jacobo cares. He cares about Edmund. Yeah. Well, like, Jacobo continuously tries to remind him, like, you have everything in the world. You don't need to do this anymore. And yep. Edmund won't hear it. And yeah, Jacopo repeatedly tries to remind Edmund that he has everything in the world to live for now. No, oh, yeah. He gets close to like Jacobo. He gets close to getting hurt because he sets, um, he lets Mercedes into his carriage. And then when she gets thrown out, he like gets him into the carriage. And he's like, listen, if you ever fucking interfere again, like I'll kill you. Like, do not do this. This is, this is mine. I will finish the job. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Oh yeah. I'll finish what I started 13 years ago. Oh my God. Yeah. Which I liked that that didn't ruin their friendship because when he did that, I was like, I was like, no, I was like, Edmund, you're becoming reckless. Don't, don't lose, don't lose Jacobo. Come on. But I'm so glad that Jacobo was like, all right, yeah, fair enough. I understand. I hope that Jacobo is just more than willing to be his straight up servant. <laughs> yes. Like this, this dynamic changed dramatically when the gold showed up. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, he takes out Vilfor in in the spa. Oh, that was such a cool scene. That's happening right now in the movie right now. I'm 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 keeping pace. This is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, you've been with the movie the whole fucking time. That's fucking awesome. Uh, uh, it's beautiful. But yeah, man, either in that scene and he fucking, you know, you like oh my God, it's such a good scene. I promise I'm not watching it to, to cheat. I just want it on in the background because yeah, I've we- watched this movie three fucking times since I watched it because it's so fucking good. In fact, I mean, I'll tell you what I what I rated at the end, and I you know you might be surprised, you might you might disagree, but I don't know. But um, but yeah, that scene where he you know turns on the steam, he's like, "It's quite enough, sir." Well, he says, "No, boy, that's enough." Oh like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's like, Yo, and the count just walks in. I love. He's like, "You are fully clothed and clearly uncomfortable, so let's leave." And he's like, "No, no, hold on, I have some questions." <laughs> I thought he was gonna like. I don't know what I thought. I thought he was going to like suffocate him in there or actually like brutally. I will say he never, until the very end, he never gets his hands dirty. He doesn't kill anyone. I mean, he, he kind of does. He hangs, um, what's, it, what's his name? Donglar. Donglar. He hangs him, but that's like the closest he gets. He just lets the law, the law take care of everything. Yeah. Well, that's what happened to him. He got yeah. put away legally because these people fucked him. And, and also, also he said at the beginning, he said when he, when Jacopo told him, 
what do we do now? He said, you know, they have to suffer. Like I suffered death's too oh, yeah, yeah. They, they need to have everything, excuse me, everything that they love ripped away from them. With Danglar, it was his business. With Vilfor, it's his position. And with Mondego, it's his wealth. And you take all of that away and then you reveal yourself. It's fucking, yep. Oh. Brilliant. And the fact that he fills the room with smoke so he can't see the, like the cops and everyone around. I know they're not cops at this point in time, but you know, they're, they're cops. Gendarmes. <laughs> Soldiers. He's like, no one will believe you. He's like, it's okay. They just heard it from you. <laughs> and then I don't know how he got rid of the steam in the room that fast. It was like it was like a it was like a it was like a like a curtain unfolded because <laughs> the steam leaves the room so quick. I love how Vilfor slowly starts to realize he's in danger when he's like, you know, why is this door locked? <laughs> and then just you know, you've proven yourself no friend of mine. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's yep. great. Which I thought that was so cool. He was um because you know you get that flashback with the meeting. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, he's like, yeah, I have a problem. My dad is a traitor. Oh no, he says, what do you say? He's like, how's your dad? And he's like, alive still. And he's like, yeah, same. And Mondego's like, ah, I understand. We share the same misfortune. It's like, ah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I get ya. All right. And then when Clarion gets killed, and he's like, you know, Mondego, why? I love that. He's like, because your son couldn't do it himself. I like, got it with the cold lines, dude. <laughs> This movie is what I think Ghost of Mars was trying to do with the one-liners. Yeah, because they had a you know a, a writer who still cared. Yeah, uh, man. Yeah, and then of course you know Vilfor panics and says you know Mondego pulled the trigger, but he'll never confess. And he's like, yeah, but you did. <laughs> yeah, soldiers. Oh God. And that's when he realizes like Dantes. Like he has that moment <laughs> of like, oh shit, I remember you. And, and then my favorite scene in the entire fucking movie is when he gets in into the carriage, he sees the gun and he laughs, puts it in his mouth, pulls the trigger. And then Dante is like, you thought I'd make it easy for you? <laughs> oh, do you? Well, I love when the, the one guy's like a courtesy for a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. And with like near zero hesitation, Bill is like, yep, OK. <laughs> and he tries yeah. to kill himself. Yep. I love to imagine he's like the last inmate of the Chateau d'If. Yo, like he's still there. He's still, oh, like man. Edmund's keeping him in a, in a cell, giving him gruel once a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, and so with good. that, he goes after Mondego. <laughs> but uh, Mercedes shows up and is like, I knew it was you. And I love the line, like, if you love me, don't rob me of my hate. Yeah. Shit. And then, after you know, battle I, that man, it's crazy. Yeah, I like the callback to the um, like the string that she tied around her finger. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I know like a lot of movies do like callbacks, but the string is like pretty because that was the day that he became captain, and that was the day he was also betrayed. So that string on her finger, I think, represents more than just like the love that they have. It yeah. represents like the day that everything like changed. And the fact that Mondego has no idea what that string is for, because it's literally just a string on her finger. So obviously he wouldn't question it, but like she, she never took it off, which um, how, how did she wash her hands by the way? Cause I'm pretty sure that string would have like come off or gotten wet. You know, this was 17th century France. I know. Nobody fucking wash their hands. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I think he should just be lucky. She doesn't have like three different strains of syphilis. Dude. <laughs> uh, and that you know that string has endured for 13 years it's it represents his strength their strength and i i love that yeah. uh and you know they they hook up and he gets up to take care of business Jacopo shows up and is like hey he wants you to leave france with him and your son she's like yay she goes back to tell for her Fernand, and he's packing up because shit got real. Yeah, he's like, oh, he, she's like, oh, are you are you leaving too? <laughs> well, he's like, I've been accused of murder and a bunch and theft and treason. Yeah, yeah, and yeah murder, like, theft. Oh, she's like, did you do it? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah. That, he, <laughs> he's like, yeah. That doesn't. Yeah, that's besides the fucking point. We gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> I take. We're gonna be taken very good care of. And she's like, I'm not going. And he like throws something at the mirror to be like, I'm a badass. Yeah, but I mean, 
He, I mean, that's what he wanted it to feel like, but all I saw was toddler. Oh yeah. He, he thinks he's a, he's a big man, but really, you know, he's a little man who yep. thinks he's big, which I got to hand it to guy Pierce. He plays that role pretty well. Like, Oh yeah. Thinking I'm a big man, but like we all, we can all tell like he, he, um, he walks the line of big badass and screaming toddler pretty, pretty well. Very well. I, I respect it. And that's when she drops the bomb of like, he's not your son. Like that's Edmund's son. And he's like, yeah goodbye whore <laughs> and then just yeah. out. it reminded me of uh remind me of that scene in uh the punisher i don't know why the punisher when uh when um oh fuck me man the villain in the punisher movie. oh saint yeah saint yeah. when he calls his wife a whore and he pushes <laughs> her out the window <laughs> i don't know why yeah it's just there's something weird about people being like you whore it's like it's it's always cringy. Like, why? It's a it's a weirdly funny insult. I don't know what it is about it. It's all about delivery. Yeah. Funny stuff. Um, so Mondego goes out to his uh, country estate where all that gold was put and finds a bunch of chests filled with dirt. Yeah, oh, God, again, fucking planned it from the beginning. Yeah. Except for one chest, which has a chess piece. Yep. And that's when <laughs> that's when the count comes out from the shadows. And just says King's to you, Fernand. He's like, oh my God. Did he 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 um because throughout the entire movie he has a mustache and like sort of a beard, but he he was clean shaven for the end. Yeah. I guess he so wanted he, Fernand to, to, to know his face. Yeah. That was fucking goddamn. <laughs> it's like how am I like, how did I escape with difficulty? How did I plan this moment with I, I don't remember what he, with the, like with pleasure. I think that's what he says. Yeah. Like oh. Fernand has the balls to ask him, why are you doing this? <laughs> yeah. Why? What did I ever do to you, man? <laughs> Shit. Hmm. Then he, he pins him to the wall. He's like, somebody taught you the sword. I love that. He immediately disarms Fernand. And yeah, that whole bit. And Fernand yeah. refuses to back down. He's like, you know, I'm, I, at least I'm actually a count. It's like, <laughs> Shit, yeah. man. Oh, yeah. Dude, he was like, you are much, what do you say? You are as much of a count as I am a peasant or something. He says something like that. I was like, damn. spits in his face. Yo, goddamn. And then Albert shows up and somehow just breaks Edmund's sword in half. (laughs) Yeah. So so I thought for a second, I thought for a second, I was like, I was like, oh shit. Like Dante's could potentially die. Cause I know I read the book, but I was like, all of the big story beats, they still hit home. Like I knew, I knew what the ultimate ending was. I know what happens, yeah. but whenever they happened, I was like, "Oh shit!" And I was like, "Fuck!" Yeah. I thought, like, is he gonna? If if nobody says anything, he's gonna kill Albert right there. He doesn't care about Mondego's son. Yeah, I thought what was gonna happen was I thought Albert was honestly for a second. I thought Albert was gonna kill Edmund, and then he was gonna get revenge. You know, on like like he would have killed. Dantes and be like, oh shit, no, oh, no, it's your dad. Oh fuck. And then he kills him. But I'm glad they didn't do that. I'm glad they stuck with. Oh my God. That would have been so. That would have been so disappointing. Two hours of build up to see Dantes take out Mondego and we don't get it. I would, yeah. I would never watch this movie again. <laughs> no, 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 no. It'll be like watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> the gold standard for fucking up an ending, <laughs> which I still haven't finished because I'm scared. I just got to season six and I'm scared. I don't want to continue. Because it's so good right now, and I want it. I want it to have a good place in my home. It. You could just end season six and just tell yourself that was a great finale, and then just move on. Because <laughs> that's what a lot of people did. I know what happens at the end. I just don't want to watch it. Yeah. I I watched it in real time, week by week, and that hurt. <laughs> Is the whole eighth season suck, or just the last episode? The first three are like really rushed. And you start getting the vibe of like, okay, something's wrong here. And then the Night King thing is wrapped up so goddamn quick. Everyone was like, what the hell? Are you kidding me? And then the ending is out of nowhere. Like everyone's out of character. Clearly they were rushing this because they were done. It was just incredibly insulting to every fan. That's awful, man, because the White Walkers were, you know, they build up so much in the Night King, so much build up and everything. And Yep. (laughs) <laughs> yeah unreal man uh i i saw in mythbusters once they tried to 
do like, can you destroy a sword with a sword? And uh, <laughs> turns out you, you can't with just an every, like with, you need like a very sharp sword, like a samurai sword can do it to like a, you know, a, a rapier. Yeah. But what happened in this movie would never really happen. <laughs> Uh, and then everyone shows up. Mercedes, Jacopo, everyone just shows up at this estate. Yeah, everyone just knows where this place is. Like, okay. And the timing was impeccable. Yeah, woo, guys. If you were a one minute too slow. Yeah. Mercedes is like, hey, that's not your dad. This really nice guy who saved your life. That's your dad. <laughs> yeah. I like how he just accepts it. He's like, he's like, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, he looks to Mondego like for answers. And he's like, yeah, it's true. Your mom's a whore. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> oh my God! Which I mean, is she really? I mean, she's not really like no, like, not at all. He's the whore. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude, she married you because she needed a, a father for her son. Yeah, she needed your. She married you for your money. <laughs> exactly, and um, I got the. Have you, have you seen uh, Les Mis? Yes. Yep. So, because like she has a bad child, so they label who label her as the whore. So, I mean, mm-hmm. that's why she married him, because I mean, otherwise she would have had nothing. So. Yeah. She dreamed a dream. And oh, my goodness. I hate watching. Like, it's it's such a well-made movie, but it's it's one of those movies where I respect. I can tell it is a very well-made movie, but it is just so fucking depressing that I cannot watch it. Saw it once. I'm good. Yep. I don't need to watch another two and a half again. hour sob story musical with no dialogue. Yeah, And it's kind of boring. It's boring and sad. But it's a very well made movie. It is. It is. Russell Crowe can sing, but you know, it's whatever. You know, the guy who directed that went on to direct Cats. Are you no fucking way? Mm hmm. Yep. How do you fall off that? I mean, John Carpenter. I mean, I recently learned fell off hard, but how do you fall off that hard? He won an Oscar for the King's Speech. He does a. He did that too? Yep. He does a revolutionized version of Les Mis and he fucking does Cats. And now he's gone. Nobody will ever hire him again. <laughs> oh my god! Holy shit! It's, it's amazing. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Uh, so Mondego decides I'm going to kill Mercedes, and that'll stop the Count of Monte Cristo. No, well, not- it'll make it worse. What are you doing? I know he he, he doesn't have very good problem solving skills. <laughs> no, uh, Jacopo. Saves her with a knife to throw. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To quote the Black Knight, tis but a scratch. Tis but a scratch. It's a flesh wound. For a second, though, I thought she was dead. And then, you know, they're all over a dead body. And then he's like, what do you say? He says, oh, God has you in his, in, in the left corner of his eye after all. She's going to be okay. I always look in that scene, like, is Edmund rolling his eyes? <laughs> when Jacopo brings up God, he's like, again? He's like, fucking stop. <laughs> and Mondego has the opportunity to leave. He's, you know, he looks at the road ahead, and, but he thinks, like, he's not going to stop. Like, yeah. This isn't over until I end it. Which, I, as unhonorable as Mondego is, I have a little bit of respect for him for turning around and facing it. Like, yeah. Throwing the gun away, drawing the sword. It's like, yeah. He, lit- he literally like just throws the gun. He's like, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to do this the right way. And Dantes goes out and they have the, the sword fight, which is great. Yeah. And that brief moment where they beat the shit out of each other. I love that. So good. Yeah. You can tell Edmund's willing to punch that face for a very long time. And uh, ultimately, Edmund gets the upper hand, stabs Mondego through the chest. Thank God. Yeah. I'm glad that... Um... So, like I said, I've watched this movie three times since um, since I originally watched it. And the first time I was like, wow, that death, it was really, um, uh, what's the word? It was very, um, fuck, what's the word? Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. Like, you just, you, know, you just get stabbed and he dies. It wasn't like a big climactic moment. I mean, it, it sort of is, but I'm, I like that he, that, that it wasn't a big triumphant like oh he's dead it was like okay he's dead now and he's just laying there in the grass where he deserves to be yeah and he gets one last you know what happened to your mercy and Edwin's like you know i'm a count not a saint yeah i'm a, I'm a 
Like, damn, dude. And he buys the Chateau Deef and uh, all is well. God gave him justice. Yeah. He, when he comes back at the, <laughs> that scene when they're standing on the cliffs in front of the prison. Perfect. And he's like, he's like you know, I bought this because I was going to tear it down, but uh, I don't want to do that anymore. I think it's an epic movie. I love how satisfying so many moments are in this film. Just watching these people get theirs is mwah, it's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I was rooting for him the entire time. I'm so glad that his plan went off without a hitch. I'm so yeah. glad that he got his revenge. And then I, I like how his character stayed very true to the fact that he wants his revenge. He's going to get it. He doesn't care what anyone, anyone wants. Well, and also it's like, once it's over, it's over. Yeah. Like he doesn't have a, th- a thirst for it. He doesn't keep going up the ladder until he's like stabbing Napoleon to death. He wants, mm-hmm. he got what he wanted. And now he's reunited with the woman he loved. He has a son. He gets to have Jacopo still hanging around. He's a fucking count. He's a count. He's the richest man in Europe and gets to just enjoy delicious fruits and creams for breakfast. So he's a, <laughs> he owns a bank, I guess now. Yeah. He's, he's- a bank, a prison, some dude's estate. I, I don't know. <laughs> Kill him. He got what he deserves. Yes, he did. God gave him justice. Uh, here are some filmgasm facts for the Count of Monte Cristo. Number one, I couldn't believe this. Arnold Schwarzenegger turned down the role of Edmund Dantes Thank very early in development of the film. Thank God. Oh, wow, man. I love Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he only plays Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, 100%. Uh, one th- I mean, no way in hell would anybody not recognize him as the Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, yes. Like, I remember the hulking Austrian dude. That's, yeah. that's Edmund Dantes. Yep. <laughs> as soon as he walks around, he's like, hi, I'm the Count of Monte Cristo. No, no, you're not. I definitely sent you to prison. <laughs> I would only watch it if Stallone is Mondego. <laughs> oh, my God. This movie would be terrible, but it would be, I would remember it. <laughs> Holy shit, man. That would be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, number two, during one of the fencing scenes between Jim Caviezel and Guy Pierce, a move was performed incorrectly and Guy Pierce was pierced. <laughs> he, oh. he got stabbed through the skin on his, on his side. Uh, they took him to a hospital. He was patched up and he was bragging about the wound proudly while Caviezel was apologizing so hard. Because he almost oh, killed a guy Pierce. Why does that fit their character so well? I know, right? He's, I'm sorry. I'm so fucking sorry to you to say, no, no, no. Yeah, that's right. I fucking got stabbed. <laughs> you know who didn't get stabbed? You, Edmund. I got stabbed. <laughs> I have something that you don't have. Aha. Oh, my God. Uh, and number three, just a little info on how all the characters uh, fare in the novel. Uh, Fernand is publicly publicly humiliated by the exposure of his old crimes, and he commits suicide. Uh, Villefort is driven insane, and Dantes leaves him that way. And Danglar loses his wealth, his wife, and his daughter, thanks to Dantes. So the stakes, a little bit higher for everybody in the book. Wow, holy shit, yeah. (laughs) But uh, I think it's still satisfying in the film, and I really enjoy this movie. I give it a 10. It's one of my favorite movies. That's exactly what I was going to say. I didn't know if you were going to agree, but like... Every time I watch it, I'm like, this movie fucking rocks. Like, I'm so glad I like I'm so glad I watched this. I give it a 10, by the way. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I watched it and then at the beginning, you know, when they on the beach, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be kind of you know, very you know, 2002 kind of boring action movie. And then as soon as it's over, it was like, I'm gonna fucking watch this again right now. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those, you know. It, it made a bit of a splash, but not a lot of people like remember it or really have like kept it in their memory. But yeah. I've always loved this movie and everyone I introduce it to also loves this movie. It's a really good movie. It really fucking is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm surprised that I gave it a 10 because it's so fucking good. Yeah, it really is. That's awesome. I'm glad you liked it that much. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. If you like the show, feel free to follow us on our socials, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Filmgasm Productions. If you want to suggest films for us to check out, you can always send us a message there or email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. Or you can check out our website, filmgasm.com, where we have reviews, articles, trailers of upcoming films, and every episode of all four of our shows, including the recently deceased sneak preview. Uh, 
Do you want to hear our thoughts on the 2020 to 20 or 2021 to 20, mid 2022 film season? There's that's where you go. <laughs> uh, if you want to support the show through anchor, you can click on support this podcast on your preferred podcast provider. And we appreciate anything you want to throw at us next week. The cycle ends for good with Austin's pick. In 1970s Los Angeles, two private eyes with vastly different methods are forced to work together to find a missing girl and investigate a connection with the porn industry in the 2016 action comedy, The Nice Guys, starring Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe. It's been a while since I watched this one, but I remember really liking it. So next week ought to be really fun. We, don't, we haven't done a lot of comedies yet. Surprise, surprise. I haven't seen it because apparently I've never seen any fucking movie ever. Um, but I'm excited because uh, you said it takes place in the 70s? Yeah, it's like set 1970s LA, San Fernando Valley, two private eyes, one who's like nice, one who's an asshole, have to team up to solve a case. Buddy cop movie. I always like buddy cop movies. I like the vibe of the 70s. Okay, I'm down. Yeah, it's really Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah. I like Ryan Gosling. I really do. I don't think he's ever been in a movie where I didn't, I didn't like it. I love La La Land so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah. And, uh, next week, this, the, what, how we've been picking them is, you know, everyone on the team gets one personal pick per cycle. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to be ending that as of next week. Uh, and leading up to our 200th, we have a five film super gauntlet of hardcore, iconic, legendary horror films that I am very excited to do with various members of the team popping in and out on that one. So it's going to be fucking cool. And then going forward with a uh, 200, one on i will address uh later on so cool stuff happening uh don't miss joe dirt on fridays beyond the bad oh god yeah <laughs> holy shit can't wait i, I fucking love joe dirt <laughs> uh and toy story 2 on oscar sunday uh in the meantime don't betray your best friend and get him arrested for treason otherwise he may just escape and systematically dismantle your entire life be king of your own moment and keep watching movies. Thank you.